of here, something a little different. Uh, I'm Rob Rowan. I'm chair of the World Affairs Council Upstate. And I want to welcome you on behalf of the World Affairs Council Board and our parent organization, Upstate International, where you will find all things cultural in the Upstate, including the great language classes. And last uh, Saturday, we had sal Friday, we had salsa at sunset. Um, so we have lots of fun events happening. The World Affairs Council of State is part of a nationwide system of organizations dedicated to engaging their communities in foreign policy, international business, and global impact issues. We are non political, non partisan, and strive to bring information in the most academic and unbiased manner we can allow. And so we can allow you to form your own opinions and ask your own questions. We are a 5013 uh, nonprofit, and we depend on your membership and your donations to fulfill our mission. If you are not a member, please consider joining us or ask your business or educational institution to partner with us. Uh, at this special summer event, I want to remind you that after this, we will be back in the fall with our Beyond the Headlines live at the Quack Center. Each monthly luncheon will explore one of the international challenges we are facing with experts from Furman University, USC Upstate, Clemson University, and other guests from outside our area. You can find more about all this by typing World Affairs Council Upstate into your browser. So at this point, let me introduce Arena Karmanova, Public Affairs Officer in the Office of Public Liaison in the State Department's Bureau of Global Public Affairs. Arena, take it away. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here today um, and have this program for you. Um, my office, the Office of Public Liaison at the State Department, uh, regularly works with World Affairs Councils across the country to put uh, programs such as this on. Um, we also work with Kiwanis clubs, Rotary clubs, chambers of commerce, and universities and high schools across the country. Um, we're really happy to be able to start conversations on certain foreign policy topics and um, have discussions about why diplomacy matters and what it is that we do around the world. Um, I'd like to play a short one minute video and we'll all get back to the program. It's a wonderful and complex world out there, filled with challenges and opportunities. That's why America's diplomats with the U.S. Department of State are on the job every day representing you. We are advancing America's foreign policy interests by uniting our allies, confronting our adversaries, and protecting our citizens. We advance democracy, human rights, global health, and more. We grow markets that create American jobs. We are America's first federal agency, and we're in 190 countries at over 270 U.S. embassies and consulates serving you. We are the United States Department of State. Thank you for watching, and I will turn it back over to you. Wow, that was great. Thank you, Rena, for sharing that informative video and uh, your support in this webinar. And uh, we look forward to working with the State Department Bureau of Global Public Affairs in the future. Uh, so now let me introduce our moderator. For many of you, Dr. Wes Strips will be a welcome returnee. He has spoken or moderated several times in the past and has always been fascinating. And his background is also very fascinating. He's very extremely passionate about studying earth systems. He grew up in suburban Philadelphia and went on to study geosciences at Amherst College, Dartmouth, and he got his PhD at the University of Wisconsin. In between degrees, he worked as an exploration geologist in oil, gas, and water sector, an environmental consultant, a hydrogeologist, a high school teacher, an outdoor educator in the Swiss Alps, and a nightclub disc jockey. <laughs> at Furman, Trips is known as a very engaging teacher. You can see why. He's an active researcher and an environmental activist and has been very involved with the university's uh, sustainability efforts and sustainability student living communities. 
He's the executive director of the Shai Institute for Sustainable Communities and a professor of Earth, Environmental and Sustainability Sciences at Furman University. Thank you again, Wes, for being part of this. I always love hearing you. And he will be joined with our, with our distinguished speaker, William Montine, or Bill, as he wants to be known. He's a career foreign service officer who joined the US State Department in January of 2001. He's been the senior advisor for Antarctic policy, always seeing the full range of political, economic, and environmental and scientific activities related to Antarctica since August of 2018. Bill also supports US engagement in the Arctic. His oversees assignments for Luanda, Angola, London, United Kingdom, Panama, Moscow, Russia, and most recently, Managua, Nicaragua, where he was economic counselor. His domestic assignments have been as a legislative affairs staffer and trade policy with South America. His wife is also a foreign service officer and they have two children. At this point, I wanna say, as you know, please turn off your video part where, and also if you have any questions, uh, put them in our chat box because uh, we'd rather have it come that way and then Bill will answer your questions. So at this point, thank you again for coming and I'm gonna hand this off to Bill Montine and let's get it started. Did I do that? Oh. There we I go there. Have... Hello there, everybody. Sorry. And no, no, thank you very much. First of all, thank you very much for this opportunity to join you all on what hopefully is going to be an interesting opportunity for all of us to engage on uh, issues related to both the Arctic and Antarctica. So first of all, thank you very much to Rob Rowan and to Dr. Drips um, and to everybody in upstate area that are um, have facilitated this um, opportunity. Um, as Rob said, I will be very interested in your comments and questions. So I'll, I'll try to keep this relatively short, but there are some points that I do want to share with you. And um, of course, uh, being a, a good government uh, bureaucrat here, there is a PowerPoint um, that I would like to share and hopefully it'll be interesting. It's got a little bit more words than what I would normally hope for, but uh, let me work on the sharing it. And um, again, please do put your comments and questions in the chat box and I will be happy to engage with them uh, after a bit. And here we go. So, Polar opposites uh, is, is what we're talking about here. Um, this first screen is not all that exciting other than this drip of water here, um, because that really is what's driving what a lot of our conversations are now, climate change. And what does that, how does that affect what we uh, in the foreign policy and in the world are doing? So this is, actually a, a slide I had a lot of fun pulling together, um, not only because it got to capture some of what is in the newspapers, what, is, what, is, you know, what are people talking about related to the Arctic and Antarctica, but it's a fascinating glimpse that it's now being reported on in everything from Forbes to a science you know, organization, physics, that is.org, um, DOD, and even the Rolling Stones is involved with conversations related to the two poles. And so that's a sign. I mean, if you got Rolling Stones talking about it, then it's got to be making mainstream. And I, I, I do find it fascinating, particularly since the uh, Rolling Stones did come up with a really catchy name for one of the glaciers, um, Doomsday Glacier uh, in Antarctica, which is fun. Um, so I do want to start off with um, some pictures. First of all, over there to the left is a picture of Antarctica. That is the United States, continental United States overlaid on it. This is our attempt to indicate the size of Antarctica. It is big. It is roughly the size of Europe or United States plus Mexico combined. Um, it is a continent, landmass, lots of ice there. 
Um, some key geographical points, and this will as much test your US geogra geography as it does anything else. Um, down in the Houston Galveston area of Texas, um, that is where the major US station is located, McMurdo. That is the largest station in Antarctica. If you move up towards Kansas City, that is roughly where Nebraska, Kansas, Iowa, and Missouri all meet. That is roughly where the South Pole is at. We keep on moving over to the upper left, past Seattle and Washington, the state of Washington. That's the peninsula, uh, this Antarctic Peninsula, which I'll refer back to. That is heading towards South America over in the very upper left corner. Now on the right hand side, you see a much more traditional looking map. It's got, you know, some not the prettiest of colors, but it does demonstrate what the uh, who, uh, what countries there are in the Arctic Circle, and that is highly relevant for who is talking about Arctic issues. Um, a key point which we'll, we'll get to is that um, there are countries in the Arctic. The United States with Alaska is one of those countries. Um, the picture of the ice, eh, not as relevant. Um, this is not really a scientific uh, picture of where the ice is at this given stage, but you will see the North Pole is located in an ocean. And so it's on ice, but it's in an ocean. So we're gonna move over here a little bit too. Now this is where I've got more words than what I normally like to do, but I thought these words were useful. Just to be clear, there is no test. Uh, but um, I, I did find this to be helpful for me, and I hope it's helpful for you for visualizing at least the polar environment and climate issues that are different for the two. You'll see Arctic, again, ocean surrounded by land, Antarctic, continent surrounded by ocean. Now, I'm going through this because mm, it's not that geography always matters, but geography is pretty darn important for determining what our policies are. And in this case, the geography is highly relevant for climate change. Again, um, on the Arctic side and Antarctic, there are different issues that are um, being brought to the forefront due to climate change. Notably, um, in the Arctic, that is the north side, as I referred to at times, um, we've got sea ice loss. Again, Arctic is essentially an ocean. Um, the climate change is causing that sea ice to melt. Now, it's not causing global sea rise, but it is creating new shipping lanes and other activities. Um, why is the sea ice melting? Well, essentially it's due to higher surface temperatures, the air temperatures. Um, you'll see it's you know, over two degrees warmer, centigrade, two degrees centigrade warmer um, than in previous years. Um, this is relevant in part because, again, referring back to North Pole is on an ocean. Um, this is why the North Pole, it, it averaged temperature in the summertime, which you know is now, um, it can be above freezing, which does result in a certain amount of melt. However, if it keeps on getting warmer as it has been doing, that melt will increase and um, there'll be less and less that freezes over during the winter time when it does get really cold. Um, as a result, you see the sea ice loss. Um, but for Antarctica, there's no continent-wide change in the overall surface temperature. You'll see here I've got that it's three degrees warmer in the peninsula than it was 40 years ago. Uh, this is where one of those headlines was that um, there was a new record high that was recognized in Antarctica. Well, it's a continent, it's a big place. Um, there's a long distance from the peninsula where that record high was to the South Pole. South Pole, you'll notice, it never gets warm. 
So in the summertime, let's say January, February time, when it gets the hottest at the South Pole, it is still not um, sunbathing weather. Um, so even a couple degrees, um, it'll take a lot of degrees of surface temperature to change for any time for the South Pole to get near North Pole levels. However, what is changing? Ice sheets. So this is what's 98% um, uh, of Antarctica is covered by ice sheets. These are otherwise known as glaciers if they're moving. And these glaciers are retreating or are going into the ocean at a increasing rate. Um, this is not due to necessarily the temperature of the air, but due to the temperature of the water. And so we watch particularly, there are three ice sheets that matter in Antarctica, peninsula in West Antarctic. Uh, that's sort of the left side of the Antarctic uh, map that I showed you earlier. And then there's East Antarctic. Now the first two, Peninsula and West Antarctic, that's got some significant uh, potential sea level rise, 0.5 meters, which again, figure a meter is roughly a yard. Um, so, or 5.6 meters. Um, those two are um, melting at a increasing rate. East Antarctic ice sheet is in fact growing. It is um, probably what is happening is what is melting in the peninsula in West Antarctic is turning into snow and being dumped on East Antarctic. And so um, the big daddy, the East Antarctic ice sheet, uh, the one where everybody worries that if, you know, if uh, that all melts, then we're truly in trouble. That one is currently growing on ice sheets. We talk about it a lot less, but Greenland is does have its own ice sheet that is melting as well, and so that is important. What does this all mean? How do we deal with what is happening in the world? So, you know, politics is another way of the same human interaction and management of particular spaces. In this particular area, we've got, again, two different scenarios for the Arctic and the Antarctic. So for the North, the Arctic, um, that picture that had the, the countries, United States, Russia, others, so there's clear sovereignty in the Arctic. We know where Alaska is. We, that is part of the United States. We can do, we, we the United States, have land in the Arctic that we treat because it is part of the United States. Um, now, people in the Arctic, that's approximately 2 million inhabitants. That's, that's not Alaska. There's not 2 million people in Alaska above the Arctic Circle. That is for the entire Arctic Circle. Um, so it includes significant numbers of uh, people in Russia that live above the Arctic Circle. But it, there's people that live there on a full-time basis, doing normal things that people do in their own house. There's you know, regular um, um, activities. There's gonna be coffee shops. I don't know if there'll be a DJ for Dr. Drips to, to work at, but um, there will be uh, the normal type activities there. As a result, there is the full range of economic issues. Um, as a result, also, of course, Alaska is part of the United States. There's no restrictions on what we can do for, to protect the United States um, from the security military perspective. Now, what is changing on the economic side? Well, yeah, that melting ice. So there is, in, as a result of melting ice, there's a new, essentially, Arctic Ocean uh, that has previously been frozen. And that now has new activities that are available to it, in this case, particularly shipping and fishing. So how do you manage what was previously 20 years ago? Not an issue, but now it is an issue. How do we, how do we deal with that? Well, in, the main, in this case, um, 
back in 1996, the US led the creation of something called the Arctic Council. And this is a relatively senior level group. It's meeting at the secretary of state level, minister level. So um, in our case, secretary of state Blinken um, anticipated for the United States in May, the most recent meeting of this previous to that, uh, Secretary of State Pompeo headed up our delegation for this Arctic Council meeting. Um, this is an opportunity for the key foreign actors or the key actors. This is for the eight Arctic states to get together and talk about Arctic issues. It provides a forum in which people can have conversations and it's got a little bit of structure. Um, in this case, um, although it meets every two years, there's regular meetings uh, at a lower level by Arctic officials. Um, so they get to work on you know, how to handle um, oil spills, um, how to do search and rescue, what can we possibly do to help out on um, environmental issues such as black carbon in order to meet the mandate our shared goals at the Arctic Council. Um, one thing that is excluded specifically are military security issues. They do not talk about military security issues, again, referring back to their sovereign land. And so it's very challenging to talk about what you can, how you might wanna restrict what you do in your own country um, because it's above a certain latitude. So key foreign actors, there's eight Arctic states. Those are listed there. There's also something called six permanent participants. Um, so these are groups of indigenous. There are indigenous that live uh, in above the Arctic circle. Um, they might previously have been known as Eskimos um, or Inuits, but the United States, Alaska, um, Canada, Russia, all this, there's their own, um, they have their own particular category. They're not a country, but their knowledge and understanding of what's happening in the Arctic is special, it's valued and must be taken into account. So they have their own special um, category. There's also non-Arctic states. That's basically everybody else. Um, so you're not, with the eight, eight Arctic states, you're an observer. And it's a closed group, meaning people cannot choose to become one of the special privileged eight or join up to be a six participant. Now, this is a very different scenario in Antarctica. Um, I had that map of the United States overlaying it, but I did not have any map that showed country territories. There's no sovereignty that is um, recognized in Antarctica. Um, Antarctica is instead governed by a treaty uh, that was negotiated, and signed in 1959 that froze territorial claims. Um, so there's no one particular country or even multiple countries that say, this is our slice of it like what we do for Alaska or Russia does for Russia. Um, so instead it's governed by Antarctic Treaty members. Um, and no permanent inhabitants. 5,000 staff and scientists, that's a heck of a lot different from what's happening up north. Unlike the Arctic, Antarctica does prohibit military measures essentially meaning that you cannot be using this non-sovereign area as a location to be conducting military drills, massing, you know, whatever aircraft you might want to. And in fact, there's unannounced inspections that are authorized um, to ensure that people, that countries are complying with the treaty, pro, uh, treaty provisions. I got to lead one of these unannounced inspections back in February of 2020 in order to verify again that no country is trying to seize or impose sovereignty over an area to ensure that they are um, not conducting military measures, um, that they are abiding by environmental and scientific activity regulations, that sort of thing. 
Um, so that, that was a very positive demonstration of what you can do in the South, these unannounced inspections. But no one can inspect what we have in Alaska. We cannot inspect what's going on in Russia on the security military side because there's no treaty situation. Um, again, due to climate change, there are changes in the Arctic. Again, the shipping fishing. But there's not, since the sea ice is not what is changing in the Antarctic, there's no, been no significant differences in the economic activities that are allowed um, or can occur there. Still dangerous place to, to do um, shipping, dangerous place to travel. Climate, just not uh, really conducive for people. That's why there's no permanent inhabitants. That's why there's only around 5,000 scientists and staff in the summer. That's the extent to which um, uh, logistics uh, can really operate there. Again, we have a series of tools, this Antarctic Treaty System, which includes that Antarctic Treaty that I mentioned, um, a 1982 agreement that focuses on marine living resources. In this case, this is krill or uh, toothfish, which you could see, toothfish you would see on your uh, restaurant menu as sea bass, Chilean sea bass and then an environmental protocol. Um, these meetings happen annually, but at a much lower level, ambassador, deputy assistant, secretary, office director level, um, but there's nothing off the table. They can cover anything that they want. Um, mentioned that the Arctic Council last met in May, the last meeting of the Antarctic Treaty uh, folks, that was in June. Um, and again, there's 29 full members. There's also 25 you know, observers, but it's open to new members. Only 12 countries signed the treaty and originally up, uh, up, uh, keeps on increasing. So for folks that are interested in Antarctica, for countries that are interested in Antarctica, they're able to join as potential full members. Again, significant difference from the Arctic. So in a brief, how do we deal with this? What are our goals really for these two very distinct regions that have different issues? So for the Arctic, you'll see that on the left. Um, so one that is free of conflict where nations act responsibly. Okay, so that's, that's gonna be similar with Antarctica, but where economic development and investment takes place, that is a significant difference from what we have in Antarctica. In the Arctic, we are interested in economic development and investment taking place because we have Americans living there. We also, we do wanna make sure that it happens in a sustainable, secure, transparent manner, as it, as it mentions, that does respect the environment and climate. And as I mentioned earlier, the indigenous people, that's those uh, six permanent participant groups uh, that, um, have just a wealth of knowledge that um, we, we do um, rely on and benefit from. And um, again, Antarctica, it doesn't have indigenous. It was really only located by people in, the, in around 1820, as frequently happens. An American, a British and a Russian all showed up at roughly the same time in similar areas. Um, and, and so nobody knows quite who uh, found Antarctica first. As a US government official, I will always say that it's the American who found, them, found it first. But again, the, on, in this particular instance, there's no indigenous that were there. Um, so no colonialism per se, uh, but uh, and no background knowledge. Um, so what are we really looking for in Antarctica? Protecting the environment. Um, preserving it for scientific research. The scientific research is, from the US perspective, vital. There's, from the US, we do three major types of scientific research in Antarctica. One is research about Antarctica itself. So this is things like penguins. You know, tell us about um, the, the local flora and fauna in Antarctica. Um, second, would be global, how it plays into the global systems. 
um, climate change being a driver on this, but back in the 80s, you know, ozone, the ozone hole was an issue. Um, it still is something to be monitored, but it is, um, it is being addressed. Um, and then the third scientific research area is that using it as a platform for understanding the galaxies. Cool, dry, dark place, fabulous for looking at stars. And so as a result, that's what we do. Um, again, we do want international cooperation, peaceful purposes. So, um, and then conservation of the uh, uh, living resources in the oceans surrounding us. So those are the, the broad statements about what our policies, our goals are towards the two polar regions. Similar, significant overlap, um, particularly the peace, um, international cooperation, but significant differences between the two, particularly on the um, economic development side, taking into account where there's people. Now, this bottom portion here, this is what we're, this is what we're encouraging countries to do to help address climate change. Now I put this here in this overlap because it applies to the Arctic and the Antarctic. This is specifically for climate change issues. Um, we, the United States are um, encouraging other countries to limit the increase to global average temperature to well below two degrees centigrade. And the closer it gets to 1.5, the better off we all are. Um, also related to this is there's a lot we do not know. And we need to do the research in order to make that, to reduce our levels of ignorance. Um, this is particularly true in Antarctica. Um, uh, people, countries have been active there for 60 years, but at 5,000 people at max, um, there's only so much you can really study. And so it's, it gets to be really, there's lots of gaps in our knowledge, um, particularly on how uh, these glacier melts are occurring. What is the speed at which they are occurring? Um, we, know, we know roughly some, some steps that can be taken to stop it. That's essentially helping to reverse this global average temperature increase. But that will help out particularly well in the north, but how will it help out on the oceans in the south? Lots to be determined. Not surprisingly, nature is complicated. And so um, we need smart people engaged. Now, um, on the advertisement that was sent out, uh, that was a picture of me back when I did the um, uh, unannounced inspection. Um, and I had a nice fluffy beard. And I no longer do, as you can see. Um, but um, my initial perspective was, you know, fluffy white beard is probably the right look for somebody working on polar issues. I have since really come to grasp that that is not necessarily the look. Um, Antarctica and Arctic, all polar activities are open to People of all types, all varieties, all are needed and all are welcomed. This applies to whatever color, gender, um, sexual preference, anything like that. And so actually I got rid of the, the beard in order to help uh, recognize that there's some fabulous people doing incredible work that do not look like your Hollywood typecasting of who would be in polar issues. I do want to highlight that all are welcomed, all are needed for engaging on scientific research and policy implementation for the polls. And so, um, you know, this is where we're at. I'm going to go back to this last picture, sort of go back to this picture once again to remind us, um, having gone through that conversation here, Again, this is what we're talking about. Um, we got the circle on, in the Arctic that covers a good slice of Russia. 
now. Um, I, I lived in Moscow, uh, worked at the U.S. Embassy there. Um, Russia is quite pleased with having Siberia and it relies upon it quite extensively for its uh, national economic development. Um, United States, um, we've got Alaska. It doesn't play quite the same central role, but there's Americans that live in Alaska that live above the Arctic Circle that we do care deeply about. In fact, um, I will um, say that um, at this last Arctic Council ministerial that occurred in May, one of the U.S. senators from Alaska joined, was part of the U.S. delegation in recognition of the significant and very personal role that Alaska plays as part of um, our Arctic policies here. No doubt um, Canada and other countries would have similar experiences. Again, Antarctica on the left-hand side, it's a big place. There's gonna be differences across the continent. Um, the peninsula in the upper left, yes, it's reasonable that it will have a different um, temperature than what the South Pole will in the center or in, you know, near the center of the continent. Uh, that said, it's still a very special place and a very fragile place from which um, significant impacts can occur, um, not just in, an, in Antarctica, but through sea level rise around the world. Um, our goal, as mentioned by um, the policies in those two areas, keep them peaceful. Let's protect the environment. Let's uh, do the scientific research in the Arctic. Let's make sure that we're taking into account indigenous. For all of these, climate change is, is an issue. The Paris Agreement, our goal is to encourage country, countries to uh, take the steps to limit global climate change, global warming uh, to less than two degrees centigrade. So with that, um, I'm gonna stop sharing here and, ah, Hello there. Um, um, I'm going to then, if this works for everybody, turn this over to Dr. Drips and um, to y'all. Thank you. No, Bill. Um, awesome, awesome. I, I love the I love the title being polar opposites because it's you know I don't think of the Arctic and Antarctica as having kind of really fundamentally different uh, policies and oversights, but you did a really good job. I think really highlighting some of the differences kind of between the two. Um, I will remind folks that are on this, if you have a, have a question, pop it in the chat. We have plenty of time to get through uh, a number of questions, some of which I've already um, written down here, but we love others. So as something comes up or you want to react to something that Bill's saying or we're talking about, uh, don't be bashful. Go ahead. We want this to be a nice interactive discussion um, moving forward. The first actually is just a simple um, pragmatic one, Bill, that Rob had asked when he was talking about when you were showing the picture of the Arctic. And the idea of kind of sovereignty with, with you know, countries having borderline, where do you know when one country's interest kind of starts and ends? Is there, since it's, it is kind of the Arctic Ocean, is that international waters? Like how, if you could tell us a little bit about that, which is maybe very different than Antarctica as to where, where do we know where one person's interests or oversight yeah. and ends? So I love simple questions and being with the government, we can make a complicated answer of it, but this is, these are um, important issues here. So, um, you know where your land ends, right? And then there's an exclusive economic zone, which is another seven, eight miles beyond that. Then you have other categories of extended continental shelves for which countries can um, exert certain levels of sovereignty over. So, in fact, there's a, um, there are some, there's a process by which countries delineate where their lines um, are. So, between the United States and Canada, we will talk with them to say, okay, this is where our, our sovereignty is in the water and yours is. This is the same for extended continental shelf. We'll do the same with Russia. Those are our, our two, two boundaries. Um, not always do we agree, even with our, our good buddies up north in Canada, but it's part of the diplomatic process. And actually one of 
the questions that is highly relevant is, um, and this is something that we may have conversations with, particularly with Russia and Canada, because they both have such large chunks of water, is what is an international water and what is domestic water? Mm -hmm. Russia is claiming a quite expansive vision of what is its domestic waters, which means it can apply a different standard, not an international standard. Uh, we, the United States, do not agree with Russia on their interpretation of it. Um, and so we will have conversations with them as to this is how you determine what is international domestic law. Um, the main vehicle that we use is the United Con Nat Nations Convention on Law of the Seas. This Law of the Seas treaty was negotiated in the 80s. The United States signed it, but we, it is not in force in the United States. We are about the only country in the world that has not ratified it. However, we treat it as if it is international law. And, um, and you know, that's, that's one of the tools, that is the main tool by which we deconflict who owns what in the waters in the Arctic and indeed elsewhere outside of um, Antarctica. No, I, and I'll ask an interesting kind of follow-on question because I think it relates to the international domestic piece is obviously the North Pole is, is uh, under ice right now, but if climate change continues, there could be a point we get to an ice-free Arctic. If it falls under international waters for fishing or other things like that, does all of a sudden that open up access to some of the non-eight border you know, countries? Do you have China and others being able to come into that space for fisheries or other kinds of development? So in fact, um, the United States and several other countries negotiated a Central Arctic Oceans Fisheries Agreement recently, and China is a member of this, that basically puts a moratorium on fishing in the Central Arctic Ocean for I believe it's 20 years. And so the goal is um, basically Let's kick that, that particular can down the road until we know better what is going to be um, the ice situation, as well as we'll have better understanding of the fish stocks in these areas. So they're, they're just now emerging from underneath the ice. What is going to be happening? Let's get a bit of an inventory so we have a baseline from which we can then make better informed policy decisions. That way we're we don't do in the this central Arctic area, this new fishing, potential fishing ground, same thing we've done elsewhere around the world, which is overfish or mm -hmm. overutilize limited resources. So um, this is a particularly great example of how science policy can intersect with environmental protection, can intersect with geopolitics in order to, to create a, um, a need, as well as a framework for addressing particular challenges. And so again, we need everybody to, uh, to, to work on these polar issues, and regardless of what anybody looks like or what, what, what they're up to, we just need folks that are smart and care about uh, protecting these areas. No, that's a, and I, I think the geopolitics is a real fascinating one, and I, I love kind of a, a, um, a take on both the Arctic and the Antarctic on this. But again, given that the Arctic has kind of more sovereignty, you know, that could also result in potential tension, right? Because there's you can have military presence and things like that. The Antarctic, probably the opposite, where there's unclear sovereignty, but that also makes it a little more ambiguous as to potential tension or, or collaboration or conflict. I'm, I'm curious, just your sense moving forward as these, you know, as we expand our footprints, do you see the Arctic and Antarctic as opportunities for, do, do you see it to be more of a collaborative, cooperative endeavor? Or do we have real concerns that there could be real tension uh, on these areas, whether it's for resources or other things? I know it's hard to have a crystal ball, but I'm, I, that's always something that I'm, you know, yeah. are, are we a half full, half empty <laughs> type of approach? Are we likely to see these as opportunities that are very positive around cooperation and collaboration or are likely to be a source of tension moving forward? I'm an optimistic person, and I believe we've got structures set up to help create uh, a positive future scenario. So in the Arctic, we have that 
Arctic Council that was established back in 96. So it's been around for not a short amount of time. And it has a good track record of collaboration on concrete issues. Again, it's things like oil spills, you know, reducing black carbon, um, you know, uh, the day-to-day -day type activities that can make a difference. But it is also demonstrating that countries can work together in a manner that facilitates um, group benefits. Similarly, in Antarctica, we've got a treaty that has been in place for 60 years. That's, you know, anything that is still active in, from the Eisenhower administration, that's pretty darn good. I mean, we've got Eisenhower, we've got the interstate system here, but there's really not a heck of a lot of examples, other examples of things that um, he did that are still being used today. And this is one of those situations where, okay, it was set up in the Cold War. This Antarctic Treaty was set up in the Cold War to reduce tensions, to remove one chunk of the globe from the Cold War battlefield. 10% of Earth's land mass is now, you know, separated. It's, you know, no clear sovereignty, um, can't do military measures down there. So that's really successful. And there's been um, significant cooperation in Antarctica, one, to further that geopolitical peace vision, but also it is a darn tough place to work. It will kill people. It still does. And it's, it requires cooperation in order to succeed. So again, when I was there for this inspection trip, so you take, if you're, if you're traveling, you take with you your own search and rescue team. So if you're on a helicopter, you've got a spare helicopter because you do not know if your own helicopter will still be functioning or if it has a problem that you, you, you need to have some, some way of rescuing. So that's the type of thing where it's just, you, you, if you're prepared, you're, you'll be fine. But if you're not prepared, anything can happen. And so um, uh, countries cooperate regardless of who the countries are. Um, so um, we will help out the Chinese, who will help out the Australians. It's just whatever is needed in order to help protect the human lives that are trying to do the scientific research that will inform the rest of us about what's happening. I, I love it. I mean, I'm, I'm an eternal optimist like yourself. And so it's always great to hear in these kind of, you know, politically divided time that we all live in across the globe, like see these as opportunities for true collaboration, cooperation. And the fact that you have decades and decades of a track record that shows like, no, no, we can cooperate around this is always, uh, I love those stories. And I, I get excited to kind of see those successes. Um, we did have a couple questions asking about exploration. In particular, there was a question from Karen about, um, are there studies going on to look at minerals under the ice in the Antarctic? And I would expand that again. I'm curious also on the Arctic side, obviously there's, I've heard grumblings of, you know, oil and gas or even mineral. Um, is there a lot of active exploration for resources or what are people thinking about both on the Arctic and the Antarctic? So we'll go with north side first. Of course, the United States and Alaska, we can, if we chose to do um, oil gas exploration, uh, we've done so in the past and could do so again. Uh, whether we choose to do so is a national decision. Um, so that's one aspect. Uh, Russia has extensive gas and oil holdings and it's, portion of the Arctic and Siberia and relies heavily on them. So um, there will continue to be certainly in Russia continued uh, development of mineral resources in its portion of the Arctic. Um, again, these are national decisions in the Arctic. Antarctica is a very different story. In Antarctica, we've got this treaty. One of the parts of this treaty is an environmental protocol that was signed in 1991. And one of the provisions of this protocol prohibits mineral exploration for anything other than a scientific purpose. So there is no commercial 
uh, exploration for, sci uh, for gas or oil or anything down there. Um, so ExxonMobil or anybody else, whomever your uh, favorite oil gas exploratory com company is, they are not in Antarctica. It is prohibited by the protocol. A second level of defense against exploration is that confused sovereignty. Let's say you did decide to break the protocol and found ooh, oil, gas, whatever, offshore. Who owns it? It is unclear. It could be anywhere from three to nine to 190 countries could claim some level of ownership over that gas strike um, or oil find. So um, in addition, there's the technical issues um, of how do you do work in this area? So um, this environmental protocol, like the treaty, has no expiration date. It is a forever agreement. And so that helps to preserve the um, very delicate Antarctic environment and science opportunities. Great question. Yeah, and, and, and I guess I'd even say beyond just the exploration, I mean, do people think there is great potential? I'm just curious, as the, as the geoscientist in me, yeah. you know, obviously I think people are obviously speculating all the time, like what lies under Antarctica? Um, I imagine some of that's doing just as geologists tend to like to think about these things, but um, even though there may be no exploration, is there, do people think there's great potential under both oh, the yeah. Arctic and the Arctic? So, you know, 200 million years ago, Antarctica was part of Gondwana land. Right. Um, which also has Africa and South America. Any land mass is likely to have something. Right. The question of the something, uh, there's multiple questions, of course. It's how much? Is it a big find or is it a small find? And then how do you get to that something? Right. So the working assumption is there's something there. Um, if you're on land, though, uh, you got to figure out how to drill through five, you know, five kilometers of ice just to get to the, to the initial surface. And then right. you got to go down from there. That's a long drill. Right. Then you got to figure out, you know, what to do with that stuff. It better be, a, there, there, there would have to be a lot of it at a high grade. Again, the something yeah. being anything. It could be gold, silver, whatever, um, oil, gas, you know. Um, so there's a lot of there's a lot of assuming, yeah. Um, but that's there's the, not a lot the, of actions there, which is yeah. Cool. No, and that's the geoscience curiosity side. Just asking, I realize there's a whole oh, bunch yeah. of <laughs> impracticalities. Yeah. I want to switch gears a little bit and come back to the climate change because I thought it was really fascinating when you were doing the polar opposite kind of comparison. I think a lot of climate scientists quick, are quick to point to the Arctic as kind of the canary in the coal mine, saying. You know, wow, it's, look what's happening at the Arctic. Like, this is just the beginning. Um, we're seeing massive loss of kind of uh, the ice sheet, et cetera. And then you had kind of a counterpoint a little bit. It's not, you know, climate change has different impacts, say, in the Antarctic, where actually we're seeing growth of ice. And I could see how, to the general masses, that could create some confusion. Like, well, climate change isn't happening. Look at the Antarctic. The ice sheets are growing instead of shrinking. So I'm just curious if that's probably something you get asked about um, but what, what, are, how do we use these as kind of litmus tests and maybe what is happening with regards to the climate science around, around each of these areas? Yeah, no, my, my working assumption is that, um, people can understand that there may be a difference in what is an issue in Key West versus Denver. And, um, so we'll, we'll, we'll give it to them straight and then take it from there. The bottom line really is from climate change is things are changing mm -hmm. due to human activity. Now, exactly how they are changing will differ. There'll be a different story in different places. You can have heat wave, you know, out west. You can have you know record cold in Texas over the, over the this past winter. It, again, the stories will be different, but. There are actions that we have taken over, you know, centuries that have led to this situation. And there are actions that we can take now to help reduce the impacts of uh, these changes. 
And we think it's desirable to do so, to make these changes in order to help, okay, up in the north, sea ice. Okay, that's melting due to warm air. Okay, well, sea ice isn't an issue down in Antarctica, but glaciers are. Okay, well, if we address the drivers of those two different changes, they both have the same driver. Right. Carbon release, you know, emissions, all, all the things that we know are, are nice and complicated and um, there's folks working on, on that aspect. These are drivers that are generally outside of the Arctic and definitely outside of the Antarctic that are causing changes in those two areas. It demonstrates that the two poles, they're not the ones that are emitting, you know, tons of carbon from huge industrial complexes. No, there's, there's, there's not huge industrial complexes um, to the same extent that there is in the rest of the developed and in the developing world. So by the developing world, by the rest of the world, we take our actions that'll help protect the two different issues or the different issues that are affecting the Arctic and the Antarctic. Yeah, no, exactly. And, and again, um, I think kind of a similar uh, kind of component in terms of just thinking about that. I know people like to think of the Amazon as kind of like, well, if we lose the Amazon, that's always used as a global example, how it could really influence kind of global, mm -hmm. have global impacts beyond just the Amazon. And I like to, I think of kind of the Arctic area in particular, and Antarctic as being something on that same scale. So like, even though the impacts are being driven by externally, if we were to lose that sea ice or have these changes, say in the Antarctic, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, because again, I think sometimes I get this like, well, that's the Arctic. Why, why should, like, that's not going to impact me here in South Carolina. But I, I remind them like, no, this is part of like, it has very large impacts on the global circulation. I didn't know if you could talk a little bit about why local residents say here in South Carolina should really care about what's happening right now in the Arctic, whether it's permafrost lost or other things like that, that could have these real kind of cascading effects on, with regards to climate change. Yeah, no, thank you very much. And that's a fascinating question. Um, both poles do contribute significantly to our weather, essentially. And so one of the conversations that is ongoing right now is the heat wave that, you know, is bringing temperatures into the hundreds in, you know, Idaho, Montana, Washington. Um, there's a conversation that this would not be possible without the effects of climate change. And I believe the, 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 the analysis has been, okay, so you have a, these polar fronts that essentially are helping to keep things cool and they are weakened now due to the weakened um, Arctic sea ice. So as a result, there's a different weather pattern that is having a direct and negative impact on those residents in the West. Now that is the West. Idaho is a long ways away from South Carolina. Um, however, nobody really wants South Carolina to be hotter in the summer. Um, you know, that's what Miami's for, right? And, you know, if, 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 if everybody's, and I was just reading a little bit, everybody's temperature, average temperature these days, you know, doing a 10, 10 year analysis um, is about, um, is, is a little bit, is warmer than what it was before. So if you did live in, your average temperature for Boston today is what it used to be for New York City, you know, 10 years ago. Similarly, um, for Philadelphia, your temperature is now what it used to be for Washington, D.C. You know, for Washington, D.C., it's probably something like Raleigh. So, you know, everybody's a little bit closer. So for, for Carolina, South Carolina, it's probably closer to more of a savanna sort of level. Again, if you wanted savanna level temperatures 10 years ago, you would have moved to savanna. Um, <laughs> now it's, that temperature is moving to you. And so if you're looking for a cooler place, you got to go north and uh, that creates a whole lot of other problems, right? Yeah. So, um, so again, that's where the Arctic matters and Antarctica as well, but to uh, so it's a lesser degree, at least for us Northern hemisphere folks. Yeah. 
Well, I'll remind folks we're coming up on the hour. It's about one o'clock. Um, I think we've got most of the questions. There is still room in the chat if someone wants to get a last question or two in before we kind of close out. Um, so I'll, I'll, I have one or two last questions that I'll just kind of end here with, with, uh, with Bill, but feel free to jump in if there's any last pressing question you want to make sure we get in. Um, I was going to say, Bill, one, one thing that's been really interesting is, and I think some people also forget is, you know, they hear, oh, it's changed by a degree or a degree and a half, and it's quick to easy dismiss that. And I'm always quick to remind them that, you know, that's a global average, that if you really look at places like the Arctic, you mentioned these feedback loops, you know, around like reflectivity and albedo and things like that, that in fact, parts of the Arctic have really seen significant changes. It's not just a degree, at times it's upwards of five, six, seven, eight, nine degrees Celsius, you know, temporary changes. So um, that's significant. <laughs> I mean, that's, you know, I think people can see that and like, wow, I get that. If, if all of a sudden it was consistently, you know, seven to 10 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than it normally is, that's a, a real game changer. Um, so I, I'm always interested to kind of point out, I don't know if you want to talk anything more about that feedback loop that you kind of alluded to up in the Arctic about why, you know, we've almost got this runaway warming that we've been seeing up in there. Whenever you look at these hot zone maps, it's always like deep, deep red up in the Arctic. Yeah, it, it's super fun because the unfortunate situation, they call it a positive feedback loop, not in the sense that the results are positive, but it keeps on building upon each other. And so if you if the temperature starts to warm up, then it starts to melt the white ice. White ice is no longer reflecting away the sun's rays. And then you get less ice and warmer temperatures, which keeps on looping and building upon each other. Now, I admit, I'm not the scientist between the two of us here. So um, uh, <laughs> this, is, this is where I rely heavily on the smart people who have doctors in their names to help me understand the fair amount of these things that happen, but it does add up. We all know that blacktop in the summer is hotter than the concrete that's going to be next to it. So you walk on the sidewalk, not the street, if, you, if, you, if you've forgotten your flip-flops and are heading back and forth from the beach. This, these are the realities that we all know, and so, so this does add up, that if you keep on adding uh, temperature loss to ice loss, then it'll speed it up. Then you get to, in the situation where we're at now, some permafrost loss. And then um, it makes it even more difficult for these ices to re-establish themselves in the winter time. And um, again, builds and builds and builds. And so I don't want to say we're at a, any runaway point, but the key thing is there are actions we could take now to slow the rise and then level it off and reduce, reduce it. Now, again, we've all just gone through that with COVID, right? And that's, that's not a necessarily a fun process or anything like that, but it's gonna be a necessary process and a longer one when it comes to environment on a global level. The globe's a big place, it's a complicated place. There's a lot of people. There will be stories of positives and negatives but it's going to be something that all of us will need to work on in the coming years. Yeah, fascinating. I, I, uh, this has been a great conversation. Uh, I really, really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to, to share this with you, Bill. Um, yeah. This is I, a priority it, for me. Well, and, and it's such an important topic and one I think, again, you know, in our day-to-day -day lives, we don't think of the polls a whole lot as much as we probably should when they are, uh, again, such critical critical masses, both, both regionally in terms of the geopolitics, but as we pointed out today, uh, very important indicators on climate change and, and are really kind of at the, at the front, forefront of and, the, and front and center where a lot of these uh, large changes are actively happening. Um, well, this is, let me just piggyback on that point. This is one of those areas where anybody can help reduce geopolitical tension mm -hmm. by helping to address the drivers that are creating the ge potential for geopolitical tension, which is climate change. And so to the extent that one person matters, we all do. We can all help out and help to create a scenario where you know, there's been no conflict in the Arctic since World War II. That's something we want to continue. There's a structure set up to help manage 
country, human interaction there. Brings in not together just the people from capitals like myself, but it brings in the indigenous in the in the Arctic, those that are living there, that have a historical stake in that area. Similarly in Antarctica, it has not been a scene for international discord. That is an impressive record. It's a continent that without violence, there's no other continent that has that. And so um, that history, and that's something that we can continue to build upon. We've got, again, we've got the structures to make that happen, but the climate change aspect is something that is not necessarily directly, that we necessarily think about climate change and conflict. Yeah. Uh, it's creating those potential drivers that my job is to prevent from turning into actual activities, but I need everyone's help yeah. on climate change issues to help with this shared vision to keep the two poles in a peaceful manner. No, I totally agree. And like, again, I love them as a source of cooperation and success, you know, given all the, the tension and doom and gloom that we often hear reported in the media, it's great to say, you know, here we have some two good examples of ways in which countries can really collaborate and cooperate around both the, the geopolitics, but also now around this issue of climate change that with, like it or not, we're all, we're all in this together. And so we got to kind yeah. of rally together to kind of. Yep. We can do so in a way that makes sense. That's the key. Let's talk about it. Let's make it happen. Let's do it. We're, we can, we're Americans. We can do that. Ag agreed. Agreed. Well, that's great. I, I, I appreciate everyone taking time out of their busy schedules. Again, Bill, thanks so much for, for volunteering your time. Um, I do want to follow on Rob's initial announcement at the beginning and remind folks that the World Affairs Council Upstate has their Beyond the Headlines, Critical Issues Impacting Our World series. Um, that's that, that upcoming monthly Lunch and Learn series. It'll start on September 15th. Um, they're very excited that it will be back in person, um, long awaited and, and probably much overdue at this point. I know we're all looking forward to a little bit of normalcy moving forward. Hopefully we keep this pandemic in check. Um, so each session will be in person at the Croc Center in downtown Greenville. It will also be streamed live. Uh, it will also be live streamed for those that want to still check in virtually. The viewers, uh, as Rob mentioned, it's always a great assortment of public policy topics um, from Israel-Palestinian conflict, China-Africa relations, Iran nuclear deal, uh, many more. They always have an amazing lineup um, in that series. And so you'll hear more about that, or you can reach out to them if you want to, or check out the website as those, those, uh, that series comes back online. And with that, I'll close us off and say thanks to everyone for attending. Thanks for all the great questions. Again, Bill, thanks for your insight and knowledge on this. Um, it's an area that I know we'll all kind of follow uh, very diligently, and I appreciate your, your insight and perspective.